every since the days of Adam and Eve. Sins growing more and more, leaving folks shattered and grieved. See the devil wanna scatter and deceive. And God's no love, he'll leave you matter to bleed. Every day getting sadder, we need the love of Jesus. Okay, Fred, uh, there's some questions I wanted to ask you. You've been out, what, how long? Uh, 25 years. 25. September 1st was 25 years. Wow, that's, you know, I can only imagine being out that long, but, you know, why don't you tell us a little of the, your struggles and adjustments you had to make since you've been out? Well, when I first, when I got out, I got married the same day that I, that I got out of prison. A uh, ministry that I worked with in Vacaville had the, the community center rented, uh, had it all set up. In fact, uh, my dress out clothes was a tuxedo that I wore to the wedding, to my marriage. And um, so I got married the same day I got out. Uh, the, one of the first things we did, we went to uh, the mall uh, a few days later. And we were at the Solano Mall, a huge two-story mall. We weren't there but about 10, 15 minutes at the most. And I told uh, Susanna that, you know what, I, I need to sit down. I need to sit down. I mean, it was so, I was just literally drained. I think what was happening is in prison, you like to know who's behind you, who's beside you, who's coming up behind you. Well, you're at the mall and these people are just walking all around you. And I'm just like doing this, doing this. And I know I was getting probably dizzy from looking around <laughs> me to see who's behind me. I told her I need to sit down. And so that was one of the experiences. Yeah, I can, I can, I can attest to that too. I mean, hey, we're so used to always being like this all the time, and you know, I can understand what you're going through right there, especially coming straight, straight out of Vacaville, because you parole from Vacaville, right? Correct. Yeah, 1985. From uh, the last five years I did was was in in Vacaville. I had done 15 years total. Went to prison in 1970 for possession of marijuana. I uh, joined the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang and uh, killed another inmate in the uh, prison in Chino and received a seven years to life sentence. From that prison, I was sent to uh, San Quentin and I was there four years. It was just total madness going on at San Quentin. Racial tension, just constant. Uh, in 1975, my cell door opened up the same time a uh, an inmate's cell door opened up who was returning to his cell from the shower. I ran down into his cell and stabbed him numerous times. And the only reason, because he was black. He had not done anything to me, but that racial tension was such that it was just madness. And then, uh, by the grace of God, they didn't file charges against me. Uh, till this day, uh, it, I'm still amazed because I walked out of that guy's cell blood all over me uh, they didn't have a knife because the 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 cell right next door to that victim cell i threw the knife underneath there and a guy named donnie uh, uh bent it wrapped it up in toilet paper and was able to flush it down the toilet this, so, this picture ahead. this picture you have here is that you during that time this was me taken in 1972 when I was going out to court for the murder that I'd committed in uh, the prison in Chino. Um, scared to death right there. It looked real hard, looked real tough. I wanted to look like that, but really inside, I was scared. Uh, I'd never uh, done anything like that before. When I was, before I went to the prison, uh, I went to prison, I was 22 years old. I was just using drugs. I was fighting, carrying on out here on the streets, but there was no gang-related stuff. And all of a sudden, now I'm taught, uh, uh, in prison with the gang, and it was. Uh, I was told that I needed to do this because I was the only one in the position to get to the guy who needed to be killed. So um, I did it. So, yeah, that was the take in 1972, like five years, 
three uh, three years later, 75, when that other stabbing happened, six months after that, they sent me to the L.A. County Jail. Uh, the same guy who uh, took care of the knife for me, he paroled. And then he got busted again, arrested. He was in L.A. County Jail. I heard he was there. I wrote him a letter, asked him to subpoena me to court. I just wanted the bus ride to get out of San Quentin. So I'm in L.A. County Jail. They put me in high power, single cell, but they allowed me to go down to the law library to make a phone call. And they put me in the law library where the phones are with the leader, of, one of the co-leaders of the Black Gorilla family, Doc Holliday, and his crime partner, Pygmy. So we greeted each other. I knew Doc from San Quentin. And um, uh, the third time, the second time I go down there, he's there again. Third time I go, uh, I took a knife and ended up stabbing him four times. And his crime partner picked me one time. And then they took the knife away from me and stabbed me ten times with my own knife. The last two times it went from my eyes. He had me flat on my back. He held, held my chin and he plunged the knife down to go into my eyes. The right one hit the, uh, my eyebrow and bounced off, and glanced off. The other one penetrated into my left eye to where it cut a nerve and I was seeing double for about eight, nine months, had to wear a patch. But when I was in LA County Jail uh, Hospital recuperating, one day I walked up to the, uh, the windows, the hospital that was on the side faced west. And one day there wasn't any smog in the city, no fog in the ocean. And I was looking out there and I said, oh my gosh, this is what I'm missing. Look at this. I saw Catalina Island. I didn't realize, I thought Catalina Island was only like three miles out, but it was 20, 28 miles away. But somehow God allowed me to see it and appreciate the beauty there. And I said to myself, this is what I'm missing. And I had the thought, you know what, if I would have died in this fight, the fellows back in San Quentin and Folsom would have talked good about me for a few days, and then I would have just been forgotten because I had done that to other guys. And I had the thought, though, you watch. When I go back to San Quentin, I'm going to receive a hero's welcome. And Sam, mm -hmm. sure enough, got back to San Quentin. I'm walking down the tier to my cell. I hear, hey, Fred, right on, brother. You did great. We're proud of you. You should have killed the blah, 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 and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking, did great? I almost lost my life. Well, what have you said about me then? What could your, I done great. What would have that done for me? I begin to see how phony, how false, how ridiculous, how ignorant it was. Well, that was in 76. Shortly thereafter, they sent me to Folsom. I was there for two years. Then they sent me back to Chino, to the same place where the murder happened, in the Palm Hall unit. And I was there three months. There was only one other AB member there with me, a guy named Spot, who was, ended up getting killed. He's dead. One day, I'm sitting in my cell sick and tired of this lifestyle. There were three, four guys, four youngsters, who Spots was talking to about bringing into the game. And I'm, I'm talking these guys out of it. Tell them you don't want it. Don't do it. Do yourself a favor. Don't get in. Just go your own way. One day I'm sitting in my cell and all of a sudden, I don't know if I was reading the Bible or if I said a prayer, but all of a sudden I just had peace of mind. I knew that I believed God. And I, had, I, I said it to myself, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus Christ. And I had peace of mind that I never experienced before. The peace that surpasses all understanding, God gave me. A couple days later, I told the one gang member, Spots, hey, I'm through with it. I told him, I'm not going to lock up in protective custody, so whatever happens, happens. He was all afraid you did a good job. Go your own way. Well, he and I were there for about another month. Nothing happened to me. He and I went back to San Quentin. I mean, back to Folsom. I was there another two years, about eight, nine months with the gang in the same unit. And hostility was growing between us. The tension was growing. I just sensed. But anyway, the staff finally saw that I had separated myself from them. I wouldn't hang with them, wouldn't exercise with them. I just stayed by myself. And then they moved me to another section of the prison. For about now, another what gave you the courage to do that? Is the courage was my Lord and Savior strength that he gave me. 
only that. I was scared. I mean, you know, I mean, here I'm a Christian, and it says you shouldn't fight, shouldn't do this, shouldn't do that, right? Peace, you know, love your enemies, and so on. So how am I going to do this, God? How am I going to do this? Step out in faith, friend. Step out in faith. Just continue, continue. And that's what I did. There was one other time, there was an incident that happened after I got back to Folsom. I was a Christian. A fight broke out with between whites and blacks on the first floor of the 4A unit. All the, Everybody up on a second tier went up to the fence, were looking down, watching this go on down on the first tier yard. And one of the guys looked up and went like this, like, what are you guys doing up there? How come you're not fighting? Somebody threw a trash can at the blacks. We started fighting. This one black and I fought. We went down to the ground. Shots were fired. Everybody stopped. And I went back to my cell, and I was sick. Oh, my gosh. I was convicted. I'm thinking, forgive me, Lord. Here I already said I'm a Christian. I dropped out, and and I, I couldn't, I couldn't, didn't have the strength to just, to, just to walk away, mm. stay on the other side. I, I sensed the... You know, the the pride, the uh, what would be thought, my image, so I ended up fighting. We stayed together. I mean, we stayed in our cells for 30 days. And we then we were coming off of lockdown. Uh, we were going to be able to go back to the exercise yard. And one, I was between two of the gang members. Kenny sent me a note saying, hey, they're going to release us tomorrow. So tomorrow... Uh, they're going to release one black, one white, one black, one white, every other one. And once they release me, there'll be four of us out there. We're going to take it to them. I said, oh, gosh, Lord. So I wrote Kenny a note. I said, look, Kenny, I am not going to take it to them. If they bring it to me, I will defend myself. That's it. And the moment I took, slid the note or underneath the bars around the, to his cell, I heard him crunch it up and flush it. And there was just like a wall of tension between us. He didn't say anything. I knew he was, he was boiling. So we go out the next day, but they only released the whites. They didn't release the blacks also. Mm. So we're out on a yard. Kenny comes up to me and goes, hey, I need to talk with you. So we sat down on a yard, and he says, no, what's this all about? He says, I told him, look, Kenny, I've become a Christian. I'm not going to do this anymore. If they bring it to me, somebody brings it to me, I'll defend myself. That's it. I'm not going to take it to them. He goes, you mean to tell me, Fred, if, if I take it to them and, and you they somebody has me on the ground, you see that uh, two guys, one or two guys, whatever, have me on the ground, you're not going to come and help me? I said, no, Kenny, not if you take it to them. If they bring it to me, us, I will defend myself. That's it. He went like this. Shook his head. He got up. When he got up, he went like this and walked, turned away. And you know what that means. That's Sammy like, man, you're the lowest. That's it. You have nothing for you. So from that point on, I separated myself. I just exercised by myself. And staff finally saw that and then moved me to another section. And then about a year later, year and a half later, they sent me to Vacaville. My last five years was done in Vacaville. I got in 1985. So like I said... Earlier, September 1st has been my silver anniversary. I've been out 25 years. I've been a chaplain at the Fresno County Jail for like seven years now. I've gone back to Folsom. I was able to go back to Folsom Prison last year in uh, 2010 with the Bill Glass Prison Ministry. That was absolutely awesome to be able to go back into Folsom on the yard. I'd never been on that yard because all the time I was in Folsom, I was always in a lockup, lockdown. But to be on the yard, to, and they allowed me in the afternoon to share for about five, ten minutes uh, my testimony about being in Folsom, about being in the gang and dropping out. And then afterwards, milling with the, the inmates. Um, it was just absolutely awesome. So uh, I was married 20, I got married the same day I got out, about 23 years, two and a half years ago, three, almost three years ago. Uh, my wife uh, ended up divorcing me. Uh, the door of divorce was final almost three years ago. Uh, one of the hardest times of my entire life. First eight months was just 
very vicious, very hard. God was the one through his word that kept me sane, kept me going. I don't think I was ever closer during those eight months ever to the Lord because, I mean, I was just talking to him throughout the day. I had to, to remain sane. Um, about eight months later, after we signed the divorce papers, uh, God gave me peace of mind. I've had peace of mind since. The Lord brought a beautiful lady named Lilia into my life. In fact, we got married uh, last October, uh, October 23rd, October 23rd, 2010. Uh, just an absolutely beautiful person. We have an awesome relationship. Very supportive of my ministry. Uh, continue going into the county jail. I go in on a Tuesday night and then and on Thursday mornings, I lead a Bible study on Thursday morning. Tuesday night, I just walk the pods, talking with guys. Mm. In fact, uh, just a couple nights ago, I mean, two, uh, two Tuesdays ago, uh, there were two different guys. Uh, they were on lockdown mm. and just talking to them through their cell. And uh, two different guys asked that to say a prayer that they want to accept the Lord. Amen. So that Amen. was just absolutely Amen. awesome. And uh, I have a my insurance broker's license uh, for about five years now. So God's grace allowed me to uh, 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 get my insurance broker's license. The scripture that comes to mind in Ephesians. It's that we're without hope, without God, without Christ. Back in 78, when I became a Christian, I began to see that I was without hope, without God, without Christ. I didn't know it prior to that. After I became a Christian, I was able to look back and see how empty, how foolish the lifestyle was. And then one scripture here that has just been real dear to me. Um is in first uh, chapter one of Colossians. It says, uh, Paul said, So from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saint of his saints of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. God has delivered us, Sammy and I, uh, Brother Rayford, and every other Christian, out of the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous Amen. light. And I could just continue praising God. The Lord uh, has blessed me with uh, the ministry at the jail, also ministry uh with a brother named J. Patrick Griffith Jr., who is the author of the uh, book Kings of Praise, right there. Kings of Praise, uh, Patrick wrote mm -hmm. about um, a two, a little two plus years ago, after he was already locked up for uh, 29 years on him. He'd been locked up 20, 32 years now, two years uh, after he got. Uh, sentence in prison. He killed another inmate in prison re and received a life sentence. But the Lord has me visiting Patrick, uh, writing to him, uh, marketing his uh, books. That's another thing that I just joy in doing. So I just praise God um, that his grace is sufficient for all my needs. Uh, and I just Praise God. Thank you, Rafer, for allowing us, Sammy and I, to share on tape here. And I'm truly blessing. We pray that the, God will use this tape, the video, to touch the lives of all those who are hurting, 
all who have words, habits, and hang-ups that uh, they will be uh, ministered to by. You know, and, and so something else I wanted to say, you know, for those of you who are, who feel that there's no other way, you know, I'm still caught up, you know, caught up in... And the propaganda, the pretty picture that's been painted before you, you know, they got your your faith, your hope, and your gang, your organization, and that you don't see no other way out, you know. You're finally opening your eyes and seeing, well, you know what age? Man, what do I do, you know? How, how do I leave? How can I? What are the fellas going to think about me? Let me tell you something, you know. Uh... They're in the same boat you are. They're on that same path as Ephesians brings out, you know, that's going in one course, leading you straight to hell. But you know what? There is a better way. And that only way to escape is through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you put your faith in Him, trust in Him with all your heart. He will, He will save you. Call on to Him. And he will answer you. And you know, I just I just wanna wanted to impart that to you, you know, to let you know that there is a better way. And you know what? We we tend to limit ourselves and and you know what our self worth thinking, well, you know, this is all I'm worth. You know, that's a life in the pit of hell. So I just wanna encourage you with that. Thank yeah. you, Rayford, for our time here. Amen. Thank you. Father, we just thank you so much. There's no name above your name. I wouldn't serve any other name. Yeah, sure. Let's see. There's power in the name. There's victory in the name. There's healing in Anointing in the name. Yes. There is peace in the name. If you would speak aloud the name, then every knee shall bow before you. Every knee. Every tongue will There's power in the name. How? So much healing.
to share with you what we do at thugexposed.org. You know, we do video production, a lot of the videos that you see on YouTube and Facebook of, you know, God's amazing uh, testimonials of His mercy and His grace and His compassion um, through the individuals that are bold enough to share their testimonies. Um, we also do gang and uh, inmate outreach at the county jail and uh, juvenile hall. Um, we also have a prison outreach ministry, which we send out free books. Um, as you go to thugexposed.org, I have four books uh, that I've written that we pass out for free. You can even go there now and get free downloads. And we appreciate when people buy them because that helps support the ministry. But we buy boxes of these books and we take them to juvenile hall, um, you know, to the jails, and sometimes we pass them out onto the streets as well. So we do that, but we do a lot of counseling at the jail, guidance sessions, I should say, at the county jail and at juvenile hall, along with prayer sessions. Uh, we believe in Mark 16, 17, that those who believe would cast out demons. And you'll see some of those testimonials um, on the website at thugexposed.org. Um, but I wanted to share with you that uh, during this time, this is, uh, you know, we're asking the individuals to just pray about uh, giving a year-end gift. Okay, because it does cost a lot of uh, funds, money to, to run the ministry. And right now, we do have a great need. I don't do this often at all, but we do have a great need. Um, uh, the ministry vehicle, uh, uh, 2007 Prius, uh, is down. I have over 400,000 miles on that vehicle and uh, took it into a shop, and it needs a new engine. <laughs> okay, so that I got blessed with a great deal. For $1,650, $1,650, they're going to install the engine, a used engine, uh, but a good working engine, and a Cadillac converter. Okay, so we're just asking, you know, for those who, uh, who maybe have never given to the ministry, and we thank you for those who have given and, and supported the ministry. But we're just asking just to pray and see if God puts on your heart to sow a seed, a tax-deductible seed, uh, before the year ends. Um, you know, of any amount, any amount. So, um, and you know, not only that, but you know, we're asking for people to partner with us because we have, you know, like I said, ongoing expenses with this ministry. I mean, we do printouts of newsletters. Not only do we purchase books, and we don't get any profit when we purchase the books because I purchase the books at cost, okay? And then from there, we just go in and a lot of times after prayer sessions or sometimes just walk in randomly at the jail on different floors and we pass out the books. And you can see the testimonials from those who have read the book. It's, so again, for those that feel led uh, within their heart to give forth a gift, you know, you can go to thugexposed.org and click that donation um, button and, and make a year-end tax deductible gift. And uh, I just want to just thank you for taking the time to listen to me. And I pray that you and your family have a blessed 2018 uh, year. Praise God.